Lord in Russellville, Alabama for nine years, Pastor Todd, for nine years and um, has just done a great work down there. Pastor Hank and I have stayed in their home. We tag team preached in their pulpit. His beautiful wife, Shirley, his daughter, Jessica, and son, Nicholas, are helping keeping the fires burning down there. Um, he has a great story. I told him to do whatever he wanted to do. When he picked this date, I didn't know it was spring break, but look, God brought most of you in, and that's awesome. It is with great honor that we receive with joy Pastor Nick McSpadden. Would you welcome him as he comes? Woo-hoo-hoo! I, uh, it, it goes without saying how honored I am to be here today, and it's, uh, you know, I, I walked in the building, and there's so many memories that come up, you know, and and I begin to think about different, by the way, let me, let me say to give honor where honors do, and, and thank you, Brother Tim, for taking us out last night, hosting us. I met you and Barb years ago at Madison, Madisonville Church of God, and uh, um, Courtney and Christine, man, you guys are awesome. I can't look at Courtney without thinking about Pastor Hank, and then my heroes here, Perry and Pam Stone, man, I'm telling you, the... Uh, of all the Sundays you had to pick, the Sunday I'm preaching, to come. And I know you got your, your pad out. You said, well, we're going to judge. what? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Man, I'm so blessed. And Sister Rhonda, um, in fact, Shirley and I were talking. Um, and I'm not, I, I try not to be sensational about anything. Whatever God does is what God does. I'm just trying to stay out of the way of it. And I've learned that over the years that, you know, God doesn't need me to do everything. He just needs me to do what he wants me to do. And... Um, so I was coming out of the, the, the uh, baptistry. We've been baptizing a lot of people lately. And this, in fact, the last seven weeks, we've had five baptisms. And uh, we had a girl get delivered not long ago that's probably going to be baptized this morning while I'm not there, which is a good thing. And my little girl is filling in for me today. So, yeah, and she, I asked her, I said, baby, you nervous? She said, yeah, I'm nervous. I said, you'll do all right. I said, you didn't travel all those years and sit through all my sermons. In fact... I will never forget as long as I live my little girl being on the front row of a church and I was going into a story she'd heard a hundred times and I watched her do this over and over and over not that you guys have ever experienced that I'm sure but I said you didn't go through all that you know for you to be uh, not to be used and God's been using her and we're in a difficult season with my son so I, uh, I just want you to, to remember that in prayer, and I may share a little bit of that in a minute, but I'm so honored. Uh, man, I'm more than honored this morning that I could even come and, and share with you guys, and uh, I won't lie, I, I love being here. I am, my family's last name is from Bradley County. My dad grew up off Spring Place Road many, many years ago, and so till I was in about, I think, uh, sixth grade, we moved to the country, and I was the kid in the country that uh, didn't want to listen to country music, but grew my hair long and banged my head and uh, didn't want to learn about you know hunting and all that stuff I wanted to rock and that's who I was um, before I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna go out of first Kings chapter 19 in a minute beginning in verse 19 but let, let me because uh, I paid honor to everybody here except the one that's not here and I told myself I wouldn't do this um, so early, early 90s, uh, Pastor Hank had a prayer meeting going on here. And it was in the mornings, and I decided, you know, I would come and attend it and be a part of it. And I never knew that I was going to come to a place in my own life that I needed him in this church. <clears throat> and I thought when I went through what I went through, with a divorce that I thought everything was done everything was over and Perry you were you were actually here on a night singing with I think the lead singers and you sang a song amen you know you got in with them was singing amen and I was the most miserable person sitting in this crowd just just a few weeks before that I had walked out and uh, I was going through divorce and I'd walked out of the building and I took my little ultra thin Bible I had and I slung it across the parking lot and I said I'm done I'm checking out of this and I was trying to use psychology on God. That's not a good thing to do. I said, if you are who you say you are, you can bring her back and you can heal all this. And I'm tired of hurting. And I'd be working. This is after I evangelized for 
the better part of four years, and I'd seen signs, wonders, miracles, tons of people filled with the Holy Ghost because the person I looked up to gave me a desire for the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be in other people. And in, in the 80s, uh, at the end of the 80s, I was attending Prospect Church of God here in town, and I'll talk about that in a minute because we're, gonna, we're just going to look at a few things here. I went to a church, Prospect Church of God, uh, wasn't a whole lot of life, and I don't mean that wrong. I don't mean that ugly. It just, But I was there for a reason. I was there to pray. I got a key to that church, and I, I wore that, that church of God blue carpet was burnt so deeply in my mind. I will never forget it as long as I live. And I would lay there for hour after hour praying. And uh, so God blessed everything. God blessed the ministry. And then all of a sudden, things came crashing down. And my, my wife said, I'm gone. I'm done. I'm finished with you. And I came here, and uh, there were some nights, and I just, I, I, that particular night, I was on my way out the door, and I, I intentionally, I said in my heart, I'm committing suicide. I hate the pressure I'm under every day. Every day I get nothing but grace to make it through one day. And I said, I'm tired of hurting. I want to feel normal. You ever been there? Now, I'm going to get in the Word in just a minute. But, and I said, God, look, I, I'm tired of hurting. On the way out the door, Perry grabbed me. He, I was trying to get away from him because he was talking to some people, and I was trying to get out. And he grabbed me and said, hey, you need to come to my house tonight. Now, him and Pam don't know, but Charlie and I used to go try to eat them out of house and home when they lived over there when they were gone. But <laughs> so I went over there that night, and it was uh, Pastor Hank, Sister Rhonda, and, and Brother Perry and Pam, and then Keith and, and Karen Dudley. And I sat there, and I felt, I felt like I was so, I, was, I just didn't know how I felt. And, uh, but I had went to the phone booth outside of here. See, listen, don't, don't tell God what you're going to do. All right, you find out what God wants you to do, but you tell God what, you, what you're going to do. And this is my life now, and I'm going to take this in my hands, and I'm going to do what I want to do, right? And uh, so that night, God was really gracious to me because I, I went to the phone booth, and I said, I'm back, well, you know, I'm, I'm dating myself when I say phone booth. You know, I'm going to find one of those anywhere, all right? So I, I, uh, I went to that phone booth, and I called Mom. I said, I'm done. I'm out. I can't live anymore like this. I'm tired of hurting. I said, I've hurt so long. And I said, I hurt, I've hurt other people. And I said, I can't, I can't get over it. I can't make it through this. And um, all of a sudden, man, the Lord, I, I heard my, wife, my mom's voice and crackle and cry. And when I hung the phone up, the Spirit of the Lord said, if you'll give me time, I'll give you a miracle. If you'll just give me some time, I'll give you a miracle. Well, I was still struggling. I mean, I walked out of here. when I, the, the day I threw my Bible across the parking lot, I said, I'm done. Now, I was too poor to afford a cassette deck in my car at that time. So I had a boom box, you know, with the large D-cell batteries. And I had that thing in my car, and I said, you know, God, I'm going right over to Bradley Mall or over to the mall at uh, Bradley Square. And I'm going to buy a Leonard Skinner double platinum. Now, I know none of you heathens in the building ever listened to that. All right? But I did. And I said, you know what? I'm going to listen to it. And I did. For several days, you know, I was trying to be rebellious. And, um, yeah, I, I heard the Lord say, get rid of the tape. I said, no, I'm not doing it. You want to deal, God? I'll get rid of the tape. You bring her back. He said, get rid of the tape. Five minutes later, the tape got eaten. I said, all right, I get it. I understand what you're saying to me. I'm done with it, and uh, I'm, I'm finished, and I, I get it. And, and really, what I'm trying to tell you is that I'm so grateful because when everything had turned in a direction that I never expected it to turn to because I was fasting and praying and, and everything, and my former wife decided to get married to somebody else, and that was her choice and all that. And I, when the news reached me, I was devastated. And the first person I called was Pastor Hank. He said, we're going out to eat Sunday after church. And he was the master of talking to three people at one time. I, I don't know how he could do it. I, I, honestly, I don't know. I'd stand there, and, and he's talking to this one, and this one, and then he knows I'm standing here. And I thought, okay, well, we may not do this. He said, no, we're going to Perkins. And we sat down at Perkins. And I hadn't said a word to him really about how I felt. I just told him, I said, look, this is gone. He said, look, we'll eat. You know, I'm busy right now, but we will eat Sunday after church. And I sat across the table, looked at him, and I was broken. 
he said and he started in and he must have read every thought that I had for the last four or five days and he went into it saying this is what you're thinking right now and I looked at him and he said but I'm going to tell you something God's going to give you another opportunity with somebody else and your life will get back to what it needs to be could I see it? No, he could. If you ever for one minute don't think you need a mentor or you need a pastor or you need somebody that's been somewhere, you, you're, you're not. No. The disciples had to follow Jesus before they could be what Jesus wanted them to be. We're going to talk about one in just a minute, Elijah and Elisha. And so uh, having said that, I want to pay honor to my friend, my pastor. So I didn't finish the story. Shirley told me to tell you that the things you've prophesied about her, about the church, we have the prophecies that you and Pastor Hank gave to the church. We have them written out, typed out. And um, the one that you said about the church won't recognize um, Shirley. They No, no, she has gone into another level of boldness. I mean, she's, uh, I, I, hey, I just stand back and rejoice, man. I don't have to do a whole lot except preach. And she's up there playing, bringing people in the presence of God. And I mean, and a lot of it has been triggered because we're having to believe for a miracle for my son. And it just triggered something. But let's, let's get into the word. Father, thank you for your goodness. But one more thing. I don't know if you remember, but Pastor Hank had, had prophesied about angelic beings in the church. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be sensational when I say this. But when I walked out of the, the baptistry, and I looked up. I didn't see any, but I knew they were there. And I walked over and I told Shirley, I said, I don't see angels, but I said, I'm telling you, I know there's angels standing up there around that baptistry. And I said, they've been here. And so I thank you for coming. And, and Lord willing, you know, you'll be back. And I know Perry has avoided coming, but he'll be there. <laughs> he is coming. He is coming. I've told my church he's coming. I know he's coming. i got to hear him. Um, let's go. First Kings chapter 19. Father, we thank you. For everything that you've done in our lives and tonight today this morning give me the grace to preach everything that I need to say to these people beginning in verse 19 first Kings chapter 19 so he departed thence and found Elisha the son of Shaphat who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him and with the 12th Elijah passed by him he cast his mantle upon him he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I'll follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? What have I done? You know, do what you got to do, brother, and what have I done? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people. And they did eat, and then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. I want to preach just for it. I don't know, you know. Uh, I always felt like every evangelist was a liar, and I was a liar for years, and then I became a pastor about time. And I'm still a liar, so praise God. So maybe just in a few minutes, we'll get through this. But I want to preach just, just for a few minutes on it's time to burn your plow. Now, I think this morning, if I've heard from the Lord correctly, it's going to be a monumental moment for someone to make a decision. And making decisions is a very difficult thing if you're not following like you need to follow. So I look at this story and I look at Elijah going up to Elijah, throwing his cloak around him. And then Elijah left his ox and ran after Elijah and said, I'm going to go have a feast with my family and then I'm going to come with you. And Elijah said, going back, what have I done to you? And so he left. He left and went back, took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered them, burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat, gave it to the people. They ate and then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Twelve in the Bible means government. And there were other plowmen in the field with different teams of oxen, but Elijah was number 12. So for a minute or two, I want to talk about the call of God on your life. And I also want to deal with up till now, you've had experiences with God and I've had experiences with God. And I'm, I'm, I'm no, I know in my heart that they're going to have deeper depths than I've ever experienced, and I expect that. And I think God is about to do something in you that's greater than you and I both can understand and expect, and I think the time that we live in requires it. 
I, I don't just think that. I know that. And I know, I realize that every time we've ever lived in requires something out of us. But the time that we're in right now requires something great out of us. So Elijah went, he found Elijah while he's plowing. Elijah runs up to him, throws his mantle on him. And immediately Elijah says, I'm coming after you. You know, I learned something. When the Holy Spirit sends someone in authority to put a mantle around you and God sends someone into your life in the, in the role of, of a mentor or, or someone to speak to you or someone that has an anointing that you need, you need to realize it's not just the work of a person, a man or a woman. It's the work of God through that person. And you can't look at it as a work of man. If you're going to look at it as a work of man, you're not going to get out of it what you need. But if you look at it as the work of the Holy Spirit that is verifying and sustaining the call of God on your life, He's going to take you to different depths of that call. See, when I got here and I was so beat down, I, I wasn't even worried about my call. I felt like it had died. But Pastor Hank knew it hadn't. He was trying to get me back to the place that I could lift my head up and continue on with what God had said to me. Because I didn't want to preach anymore. For the first time since I got called to preach, I didn't care anything about preaching. I didn't want to preach. And I didn't preach for nine months. I didn't want to preach. I didn't care anything about it. But you know what I found out? Most of the time when the Holy Spirit enters our lives and lays a call upon us, and He puts His mantle upon us for a certain task, He invades our space. And He doesn't stop invading our space. And even when you don't know He's there, He's still invading your space. And even when you feel like every obstacle in the world has been stacked against you and you don't know what you're going to do next, He invades your space. And that's, that's what you've got to hang on to. Is that the moment might be the moment, but the moment is not the finality of all that God is trying to do in your life. You're in a place, and I don't know where everyone is. Obviously, we're in different places. But the good news about it is God's hand is upon each and every one of us. And no matter where we are, He's taking us somewhere. And that's what I want. And when we know that God has done something, you know, I told you about in the 1980s, I went to Prospect Church of God, and there wasn't a whole lot going on. I'd come out of a live church in, 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 in Watts Bar Church of God, and this church was singing. I don't, I'm sorry, I shouldn't even say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. They sang He Abides so much at Prospect Church of God, I could have sang it backwards. I heard my mentor one time say, ah, oh, there's some churches so dead that at 6 o'clock in the evening you can stand there and you can watch by the clock and tell you everything that's going on. That was one of those churches. Huh. But God sent me there so I could lay on that blue carpet and cry and call and pray. And my hunger led me to a place that I felt like if God didn't touch me, I was going to die. And I'm in that place again now. When I walk into church, I've told the Lord, I've been through my seasons pastoring, and I'm tired of the ordinary. I don't want the ordinary. I don't want orthodoxy. I want you to be God above all that's going on, and I just want to stand there and be a part of it. Now, I'm, I'm going somewhere with all this. And here it is. Remember the story of Naomi and Ruth. And I know you guys, you've heard better preaching than I've preached about 10 sermons, if not more than that, out of the book of Ruth. Some might have and might not have come out of a book by Perry Stone called Lay It On Me. <laughs> there are no royalties coming, I'll just tell you right now. <laughs> I think I paid those royalties years ago going to the cookout or whatever and getting him some hamburgers and stuff. But no, I'm just kidding. Great book, and I have, I've gleaned from Perry and never told him, but... Um, but I look at this story, and Naomi's ready to leave Moab. That's God's wash pot, right? She's lost her husband, lost her sons. And now she has two Gentile daughter-in-laws who follow her to the border, but cannot, one of them cannot cross it, Orpah and Ruth. And Naomi wanted to go back home because she heard there's bread there. So she's ready to leave, and she's ready to go where there's something that she needs. And the thought hit me, both of those girls had the same mother-in-law. Both of those girls were part of the same family. Both of those girls saw the same things, and yet when they get to the border, Orpah backs out, and the Bible says in particular that she turned back to her other gods. Now, I'm going to make a statement that the Holy Spirit has been pounding in me for the last three days because I've been praying about what to preach. Sometimes you've got to check your evolution. Have you evolved? Have you transformed? 
The Bible says in Revelation, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the choice is you either conform or you transform. And if you're conforming, you, you don't want God to do anything. You're happy in your familiar things, in your familiar place, and doing the same thing. And, and I'm not saying I've never been there because I have. But when you want transformation, if you can't look back at a time in your life and say, I'm different from that person that I was years ago, then what kind of progress has been made? Hmm? If anything that I've learned pastoring, I have enjoyed it so much, much, much more than I ever said. Shirley would tell me, hey, uh, our home church, the, it was the Russell Church. God, I changed the name because the Lord gave me the name Gateway. He said, I want you to call it Gateway Church. And, uh, and the reason is it's on one side of the city, and then when you come in, you come in, and our church is over to the left as soon as you come into town. And the other is, is very obvious. It's a gateway to the things of God. And so I, uh, I, I changed the name, but Shirley, every time we would have a, pastoral change he'd say you ready to pastor I said no are you kidding me I don't want to pastor your family I love them and she said Tommy Bates does it I said I don't care what Tommy Bates does I don't want to pastor your family and when I first moved there and pardon me I know we got Alabama fans in the house I grew up here all right <laughs> so and we have the big jersey day every year, you know, and everybody wears their colors. And I walk in, I got 90% of the crowd that are Bama fans. And I love them and they love me, but they're going to rag me as much as they can <clears throat> until this year. But anyway, that's all I'll say. Last year, I'm sorry, last year. But um, so, I, I, man, look, I look back and I think, God, I'm not the same person I was. But I had to move to get what God wanted me to have. I told Shirley, I'll never know. I, man, the day you see me, well, I don't want to, I don't want to pack up and go, because I didn't like Russell, Alabama, when I first moved there. I couldn't stand it. I was out here running, man, when I was divorced, and and I met Shirley, and we connected, and as friendship. Some of y'all that are single, you need to have friendship before you have anything else. If you got a friendship, you can live through anything. You can live through building a house. You can live through remodeling a house. You can live through pastoral arguments you've had right before. Not, not, not that you and pastor ever had any. Pastoral arguments that you had right before you walk in a building and come in and smile and know you still love each other. But you don't agree. And, uh, <laughs> but I knew, I looked back and I said, God, you have changed me. My son, you know what will get you? It's when your son's a little boy and he starts getting in the car with you, hiding in the back seat, and you're about to pull out to go four hours away. And he says, uh-uh, please don't do that. Don't do that. So I went inside the house and slept until he fell asleep and laid with him and then got to a church about two hours before I was supposed to preach and preach that morning because he meant something to me. You know, if you have something that God has given you, people can tell how much you value it by how much you take care of it. All right? And so I do my best to take care of the family that I didn't ever think I would have. When I was going here, the devil would tell me, you're too stupid to have children. You will never have children. You're not going to have children. You know, there's, you have messed your life up so bad that you're never going to come out of this. If anybody has heard that in this building, the devil is what he's always been. He is a liar. But the problem with Orpah was she couldn't evolve. She couldn't transform. She couldn't move beyond what she'd seen and what she'd been around, and all that kept pulling her back. You're going to have to make a decision somewhere down the line in life. I'm either going to pass this test, and I'm going to cross this border, and I may not know everything that's on the other side, but I know that God is leading me somewhere in all of this, and I am going to follow it, or I'm not. I'm done. I'm going to go somewhere else and just do what I've always done. So Ruth says, no, no, no. I don't want to go with her. There's been too much work in me. Been too much transformation in me. I've been through too much with you to leave you. I don't care about those things that we enjoy back in our land. I don't want those gods. I don't want that stuff. I don't need any of that. I don't, I'm not built for that anymore. I'm not built for that. I am going to follow you. Where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I lodge. I am going to serve your God. Hallelujah. That is what God is saying to us. Can you pick up, no matter where you've been or what you've done, 
and just simply follow and can you evolve from who you've been that's what the Lord's been telling me this week and there's some changes taking place right now because God is taking you somewhere and you got to draw a line as the old proverbial saying is in the sand because hunger has a, a way of drawing real determination out of the people of God hunger and, and you know what and, and this is I know this I guess the things that God has taught me the most about pastoring is I've got five lessons that I think that are the big biggest lessons things that Pastor Hank knew a long time ago he would get up and talk about he'd have, he'd have pastoral counseling sessions where he wanted to open the window and scream at it and I was thinking why would you tell on me like that in front of all these people <laughs> but I tell you what I love most about it is that God you know it was cut and dry as an evangelist I could preach whatever I wanted to I didn't have to stay and you know right was right wrong was wrong and it still is but the Lord told me if you love people and you'll work with them where they are in the seasons they're in. I'll do miracles. And I didn't step out away from my own pulpit for about three or four years because I didn't feel like I should. I needed to be there. And finally, they, they got me a bus ticket and sent me off. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I went to Delaware. And while I was there, I was, I was preaching at the church that I met. And by the way, this is a, a guy from our church, an evangelist named Deacon McGinnis, who's moved from Texas to come and be a part of our church. And love him man he's, he's like a brother to me but I went back to preach at, at the Bethel church there in Delaware and while I was there the Lord told me about a couple of my church he said if you'd mishandled that you wouldn't have them right now and they were living together and all I would say to him I, I would just pat him on the back say you know I'm available for marriages anytime you want. weddings weddings I'm available for weddings anytime you need I will do it and that's all I would say and finally, the day came when they sat down and said, hey, we want to counsel with you. We want to talk. We want to get married. And now they got beautiful children. They're doing fine, you know, and stuff. And he's got a business that, and he struggles from time to time, but he's still got business, and I'm still looking at him, and I'm still looking at people. And, and I know, oh, I know what Pastor Hank meant when he talked about wanting to scream in a council meeting. But instead of screaming, I start laughing, and they'll look at me and say, why are you laughing? I mean, they're telling me their heart story, their life, and I start snickering, I start laughing, I'll say, because I've been right where you are. And I know right now it looks really bad, but you can't discount what God wants to do. Don't do it. Because for every lie, and, and I'm probably going to mess these notes up real bad, but for every lie the enemy has ever told me, especially the year and a half that I was attending here, God has more than doubled. He has provided above and beyond. i got a church that is, loves me, that's growing that's being blessed I got two kids and one of them just needs a reckoning with God you know yeah he is he is we were praying last night in the hotel room and by the way I don't know they got the Hamptons it's a beautiful hotel but on the screen of the TV they got it says welcome and it said Rhonda all night welcome Rhonda welcome Rhonda anyway just decide yeah right so we're praying we're praying all night, you know, kind of off and on all night. We're praying, and it hit me. The prodigal son had a father that had a fatted calf waiting for him to come home. My son, you just don't realize it. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us to the end of this in just a minute because I don't feel like I need to speak much longer. But my son, who helped, the, helped on the praise team, my son grew up supporting the work of the ministry there I've seen him laying hands on people and them getting filled with the Holy Spirit I've watched God use him Tim I've seen him prophesy I've seen him come into my office and tell me dad God spoke to me my son got his first taste of freedom at the University of North Alabama and gets me in the car and says I need to talk to you and mom he said in fact I'm just going to talk to you now I don't think I believe in God anymore won't go to church Mama's begged him, pleaded with him. I don't fight with him. I looked at him, and all of a sudden I realized one thing. I said, well, you know what, son? And it made him mad that I wouldn't fight with him. God, he's so much like me. I wouldn't fight with him. I just looked at him, and I said, you know, you can't live off my faith anyway because I'm not always going to be here. You've got to have your own experience with God, and God can answer any question you've got. And all you've got to do is keep asking those questions, and son, he's going to answer them. And, you know, and it's, and it's tearing his mama's heart out. 
and I've got to pray her through. And there's nights I'll look at her and I'll say, I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry. Because the more we try, I don't push anything because the more she tries to tell him what you come, he's, he's, but he came home last night for a little bit. He laid on the bed with my daughter and my wife a little bit and talked with them. Huh. I don't even know if there's going to be a second semester. All I know is that God has him in his hand. And I've heard, I've heard that kid sing and lead. And I've seen the anointing go through him. Ooh. And all I know is that if God could lead me through what he led me through years ago right here in this building, that God can take me through anything that my family is going through. And I will forever be grateful for a church that said, whosoever just come in we don't care what's wrong we don't care how broken you are we don't care because we've seen God do that thing over and over and over again and last time I checked church isn't for everybody that's got it all together because if you got it all together why would you need anything in the first place so when people come into our church and they're broken and beat down and we just cast devils out of a girl that was in witchcraft, burned about $1,000 worth of witchcraft books and stuff, I'm telling you right now, it is a time for whosoever to come. Whatever God wants to do. But there are some things you will never experience. And, and, and again, I'm, I, I wouldn't ever, you know, my church, I might push a little bit more, but not here. But there's some things that if you never burn the plow, you're never going to experience. If you never burn the thing, you know what the plow represents, right? Familiarity. Everything you might be doing is wrong. All the things that you've been doing, all this over and over and over again. Why in the world, when you know God has so much more, would you ever settle for just saying, I'm going to be here in this ordinary thing and stay just the way I am? Because if there's one thing I enjoy doing, is I tell my church all the time, your victories are my victories. When I see you succeed, I stand up and I applaud and rejoice. Because I know in my own personal life, I know what victories are about. And they're awesome. But just because you're down right now doesn't mean you're going to stay there that long. He is still lifting up all that are feeble. Hallelujah. Somebody give him praise and glory and honor. Hallelujah. So, if you burn the plow, it means you're cooperating with the Holy Spirit. I burnt the plow by moving from Cleveland, Tennessee to Russell, Alabama. I burnt the plow by leaving what I loved for years, 23 years of evangelizing. And finally, at the end of 2014, Shirley said, oh my gosh, are you not booking anything for 2015? I said, no. I said, no. The community I didn't love, I'm crazy about now. There's nowhere I go in my, my, my city that people don't know me. The community I couldn't stand. I go and I eat with the kids at the middle school and I sit there and I cut up with them and laugh with them and I'm 50 something years old none of your business I'm 59 years old and I go to the middle school I try to go once a week and I sit with those kids in that middle school because I love them I love the high school I'm the only Pentecostal that's ever done baccalaureate and no I didn't speak in tongues if you're wondering I'm the only Pentecostal that's ever prayed in for the new council that's come into the city. My wife works right down the hall from the mayor. God's given us favor. Huh. The first thing I did when I started pastoring is I hit the ground running. God said, if, you'll, if you will join these pastors' hearts together, I'll do a work. And that's what we started doing was meeting with these pastors, loving them. Now they know me. They know the moment they bring up Calvinism, I'm, I'm going to yawn. They know I speak in tongues. I was about to walk into my office one day, and I look, and Shirley's got the First Baptist uh, and, and Calvary Baptist has got their music directors in there. They were planning a thing together. I said, shut the door. I'm going to be in here praying in tongues if you all don't mind. They know me, but I know them, and I love them like brothers. If you want to do something in your city, you got to do it. But let me get back. Let me get off that. I'm sorry. I, I can't. Here's what I learned. I can't take old mindsets into new places. If I take an old mindset into a new place, and I'm destroying my future or what God wants to do there. So I've got to learn what God is saying to me in that season. 
Now, what I do know is this. If there's one thing that I've seen mess up people from going to the next place, it's relationships. And I'm going to close with this right here. I don't know how many closing Sister Rhonda has, but I have one. <laughs> Ten facts about relationships that I want you to get and I want you to think about. Okay, number one is this. Your friends or your friend will either de definitely affect your future, right? They'll either be a weed or they'll be a flower. Something grows in the seeds of relationships. You need to find out the people around you if they're weeds or they're flowers. Number two, every relationship either is a weakness or it's a strength, it's an asset or it's a liability. And as I've learned and you've learned over the years, there's some people that need to be closer than other people need to be. And every relationship has a current that either moves you toward God and what God has for you or moves you away from God. How many people in ministry have messed up because they had the wrong people around them at, at, at the wrong times? And they got in a current that was pulling them away from a higher calling. Number four, relationships, if you're not careful, can damage you in such an irreparable way. Why do you think the Bible says in Ephesians that have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness? Number five, some relationships that you have will either multiply the wisdom that you already have within you, and some relationships can, can diminish the wisdom that God has placed within you. Why do you think I was trying to go to VOE all the time? Why do you think I was over there, man? I was trying to get something I didn't have. Why do you think I was pulling on your coattail? Why do you think I was in there in the prayer room with you? Why do you think I was going in there and sitting down and saying, well, let me, let me, just let me hang out because I wanted something. And if you get deterred, just keep going after it. <laughs> this church has raised up so many ministries and so many ministers. And so many people that are out there in the ministry that have been fostered here or blessed here or helped here. Well, I hear a word from the Lord to tell you, Sister Rhonda, that's not going to stop. It's going to get bigger. It's going to get bigger. There are people in life that, and this is, let me get back to this. Number six, when Satan wants to destroy you, he usually brings a person into your life. All right? And, and you know, they'll be sent with insight from the enemy on what your weakness is to try to bring you down number seven there are people that will increase you or decrease you find out which one that person is number eight there are people that only make withdrawals on your life and as a pastor you find that you know that you understand that and there's times that I've walked back in the house and I am depleted that's why I laugh I know some people think man he's ever serious about anything no I laugh because laughter is like a medicine you know it is. And if I didn't laugh, I'd, I'd die. Courtney, I'd die. I would. He knows. You know, my assistant pastor knows. Shirley knows. Sure, I accuse Shirley of not having a sense of humor. I said, you just don't have a sense of humor. Well, she pulled one on the women's ladies at, at their small group the other night. When she told me what she did, I applauded. I said, oh. I said, you have learned something from me. Hallelujah. Somebody said, Pastor, why'd you do that to one of your members? I said, what's the use of having members if you can't have fun with them, right? At their expense, praise God. They know I love them. In fact, if I didn't pick on some of them, I mean, I loved it. Those, ladies, those older ladies in my church that I love dearly, they'll clutch that pocketbook like they've got a million dollars in it. And I'd be in the back of the church greeting people, and they'd have that pocketbook like that, and I'd reach behind them. This is broad daylight. Every light in the house is on. They're about to leave church on Sunday morning. I'd grab that pocketbook like I was going to snatch it, and they'd start screaming. I'd say, I'd say, why are you screaming? Oh, I thought. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm going to be judged for that. I'm sorry. But I've had so much fun with my people, and they know it. They, if they ever see me where I'm not having fun, they know something's wrong. Boy, I, the Holy Ghost. Oh, I just felt the Lord move in. <laughs> I, I had. Let me get these out. Number eight, there are people who only make withdrawals. Number nine, a friendship can either abort or advance the dream God's given you. Number ten, no relationship should ever be insignificant. You're either helping people, leading people, or people are leading you, or you're trying to get away from people. And, and that's the thing. My goodness, I feel the Holy Ghost. I had to come back here. I, I wanted to come. I've been looking forward to this because I wanted to say thank you. And a lot of you weren't even here during those days. And I didn't even know Sister Rhonda that much. I mean, I'd say hi to her occasionally. And I remember when my mother died, she was so kind to me when she saw me. Right, My mother went here for a season. And uh, 
she was so kind to me and some of the ladies in the church that hugged my neck when my mother had passed away. And so I was in a difficult year. 94 was the year I wanted to burn. I got divorce papers at the beginning of 94. I lost my mother, my first best friend, at the end of 94. And if it hadn't been for this church and Perry and Pam Stone and some other friends of mine, I would never have made it. I wouldn't have. I'd been gone. So thank you. I, I could... You know what I really miss? I can't call Pastor Hank anymore and say, hey, I got, I got a problem. I didn't do it a lot. You know, I don't want to wear people out with my pastor. Would you just, would you just honor the king right now? Fine. My son had made a mistake. And Pam, when he made the mistake, my assistant pastor was my youth pastor at the time. He went in and, and talked to him about it, and he called me in and said, hey, this is what Nicholas has done. I didn't name him, by the way. My, my wife named him. I didn't want him to be Nicholas Jr. So I said, he can't have my middle name. His middle name's Daniel because he's going to be a prophet. So I walk in, I sat down with my son. And I said, I think it's time that you understood something. I want to talk to you about the difference between law and grace. And I went through this thing of teaching him what the difference between law and grace is and how that we're living in grace and how that even though he's messed up, I'm not mad at him, not angry with him. I said, you're going to be okay. And it blew his mind. The one night, because he'll tell me now, I said, I, don't, I won't drink anymore. I said, I can't stand it. See, that's what I was. I was an alcoholic when God delivered me, 22 years of age. The one night, he came home drunk. My little boy that raised in church, my little boy that whew, messed up more altar calls of mine than you can begin to imagine. I'd be preaching, Perry, I'd be preaching on reverence, reverence in God. Having the fear of God back in your life. My son would be in the back of the church tearing it up. He busted loose in the middle of an altar call one time from his mom to run up and hand me a chapstick. I, I told my daughter and, my, and her cousin, keep him in the nursery. He ran down the hallway one night, got into the, uh, the grate, the return grate. And as I'm giving an altar call, he goes, <laughs> One night I called Shirley. I was in a big west. T.L. Lowry was on me. I was like, God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Get it. Get up here. And I was prophesying over people. I said, somebody go get my wife. She looked at me when she came out. Like, if this isn't God and it's you, I'm going to kill you. And so this woman said, oh, I'll watch him. So I'm, I'm telling this woman, I said, sure, I need you to help me pray for her. Put your hand on me. I said, this one. All of a sudden we hear crash, boom, bang behind us. He has turned over the whole communion table. But the little boy that was growing up was at OCI on his face. And some of the Baptist kids he brought with him got filled with the Holy Ghost. And they're still part of a church. And that same little boy that started playing on the praise team started singing. Huh. I look at that now and I think, dear God, where did my time go? And, and trust me, I grew up with an East Tennessee dad who was straightforward, who didn't know a lot about love because his own father, my grandfather, who was raised behind, well, I don't know if he was raised there, but my grandmother lived behind North Cleveland Baptist Church. My grandfather raised right here in Cleveland, Tennessee. He was died when my dad was eight. Huh. And I think about the way my dad would have done things and I start to become that for a few minutes and I want to call him and let him have it because he knows better. And every time I hear rebellion come out of his mouth, I just want to smack him because I know that's not who he's supposed to be. I can't because this isn't my work right now. 
It's God's. And I told my wife on the phone last night, I said, let me tell you something. We might not have a fatty calf somewhere, but the expectation is God, I feel the, Ghost. the expectation has got to be there because we're going to celebrate His home. And some of you have been right where I am right now, and I see it in your face, and you know what it feels like. And you know what it is when you know you've seen the Holy Ghost all over that kid. He was the kid that was playing high school baseball when they got him in a <laughs> when they got him in the bus and said, Oh, you're a tongue talker. And he didn't know what to do, what to say. And they started making fun of him. He come home and said, Dad, I don't like that. I said, You don't have to like it. But just live with it. It's just for a season. And by the way, the main kid, let me tell you what God did. The main kid that was giving him a problem. One morning I wasn't even preaching on hell, I was just preaching. And I stopped at the end of my sermon. I said, I'm done with that. There's somebody in here on their way to hell right now. And I started talking about hell. That kid ran up to the altar, got saved, and was on the praise team. Got filled with the Holy Ghost. I was on the praise team. And is now he calls me. He's in college. And he calls me. He's playing baseball in college right now. But my baby, that would tell me when he was young, God, Dad speaks to you, but he doesn't speak to me. We had revival that lasted 10 weeks with a guy named Jody Rogers out of Texas. I looked down at the altar. Nicholas is crying like I've never seen him cry. I said, what's going on? He said, God just spoke to me, Dad. Those are priceless. He loves Brother Lahan. Brother Lahan was there last time, and I knew Nicholas was checking out. I just didn't want to admit it. I knew. I could tell he was checking out. He would play, and he'd sit down. He'd say, Mom, I don't want to sing anymore. I knew he was checking out. Brother Lahan, last time he came and preached for me, he looked at him and said, Nicholas, don't you do it. The greater is he that's within me than he that's in this world. Perry, I can't repay you for all. Ron, I can't repay you for all. But if there's one thing I learned from you guys, it's faith. Oh my gosh, it's faith. Faith regardless. Whew. I'm done. Would you lift your hands and praise him right now? He's... God, I thank you, Jesus. Huh. Yeah. I don't, Lord, I don't want to do anything or say anything that would be out of what you would do. And I just need you to speak to hearts. Mm. <laughs> oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. There's a few of you right now need to just say, God, I'm going to burn this plow. In fact, can I, if you, you, you stay seated if you need to stay seated. Please, I'm not one that pushes that you have to you know, stand up in the middle of anything. But if you would stand right now, let's stand. In your own heart today, if there's something you've got to burn that's in the way of what God wants to do, why don't you do that? You say, but, but I, I won't have the power. Ask the Lord for the strength. Ask the Lord for the strength. He'll give it. He'll give it. Hmm. David said, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Hmm. Lord, I've learned I can sing through any battle. I can sing through any problem. I can sing through any difficulty because... The world didn't give me my song. I love you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this building. But thank you for the people that have made this building. I thank you for the legacy of Pastor Hank Davis and Sister Rhonda Davis. God, not just as evangelists, but God, they planted themselves here and raised up people here. And I thank you, God, for their, their daughters, Lord, and the incredible anointing that's in their lives and the son-in-law, beautiful grandkids. 
Aleluya. You, uh, Courtney, you, you and your husband, can you guys come here for a minute? And um, I've always had a heart for pastor's kids. I, I think I've probably had between 50 and 70 pastor's kids over the years baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'd go to churches, and that's be one of the first, first things I'd ask them is, you ever been filled with the Holy Spirit? They said, okay, come to revival. You guys really love young people, don't you? It's really in your hearts. It's not something, well, I'm going to do this till I get to the next place. It's something you guys have in your hearts. And a lot of it's because your own journeys you've been on. Like, we all use our journeys in life for ministry. That's why we've had that journey. Maybe, and in my own, I'm, I'm talking about my own particular life, even though I've I've made some wrong decisions. I've still used my journey of where I've been because God's faithful. So, and I know she's going to touch on the power of words this coming week, but I hear the Lord telling me to tell you, if you'll ask for it, He'll do it. More. And, and I'm, I'm doing the same thing, but I can only handle what my church is ready to handle. And then there's times I can't even handle that, you know, because I, I don't know how. I'm just trying to follow the Holy Ghost. That's what you're doing. And that's what you've been doing. And you got a whole lot of the same things your dad had. You don't just look like him. There's some things in you that you have just like him. When it comes to people. And God's pulling all that out. Because you know how messed up some of these kids can be when they come in. You go, well, praise God, here's another one. And praise God, here's another one's friend. And praise God, here's that one. <laughs> you know, I looked up the other night... And there was all sorts of colors in my church. And I was like, yes, Jesus, let it be so. Let Jesus, let it be so. And then I started getting the backstories to these people and how, <clears throat> well, that one, that, that one right there, their, their father left the family. Or the mother signed over rights. <clears throat> the Hispanic man in my church, his name's Manny. That's all I'll say. Manny. He, 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 him and his wife came for about a year or so and they weren't, he, they'd come and pray but I knew they were out partying I never said anything to them I knew it I'd see the, you know they'd, they'd be partying I'd see it on Facebook never said a lot to them man he's got some kids he's been bringing back to church lately he's been divorced since last July he said pastor he called me the other night he said pastor I don't know what you, you did to me I said what do you mean he said, I didn't, I didn't, he said, you know, I've been coming off and on for a while. I said, I didn't believe in all that falling out stuff. <laughs> he said, when you laid that Bible on me, he said, something happened. I, I woke up on the ground and he said, I feel different. <laughs> then he said, because if we don't love them, who's going to love them? Right? If we don't, if we don't love them, man, who's going to do it? And that's why, Shirley, when we, were, when we first had our first home, we got married, we opened our home to all the youth in the church. We said, come on. And they wouldn't leave some nights. I'd wake up in the morning, they'd be, they'd be laying all over the house sleeping, you know. <laughs> Manny calls me. He says, hey, I just want to let you know, said, Manny Jr.'s throwing in the 80s baseball. He's 15 years old on varsity. He's playing for Bell Green. And his mom signed over rights and said she don't want anything to do with him. It's just a devastated kid. This is what we go through. And by the way, on a side note, <laughs> Manny calls me the other night. He, I'm, I'm, I'm hosting a couple, new couple in our church, Shirley and I, and I look down and there's a message from him. He said, hey, can you call me? Can I talk to you? Pastor, I need to talk to you. I said, yeah, yeah, what is it? Finally, they leave. I said, what is it? He said, I don't know what God did. He said, I don't know what you and God did to me. But he said, I've been feeling different. He said, I'm crossing the bridge from Florence <laughs> to Muscle Shoals. And he said, I'm listening to my Mexican music. Oh, that was a shock. <laughs> And he said, in the middle of all that, he said, I start feeling God coming in my car. And he said, I said, okay, God, okay, what do you want, what do you want, what do you want? He said, next thing I know, I'm on the side of the road, crying, speaking in tongues. I don't even know if the guy, I think the guy just recently got saved. So he's calling me and he's saying, Pastor, I don't know what the H-E-L-L -L happened in my car. And I'm trying not to laugh. He said again, he said, Pastor, I really don't know what the H-E-L-L -L is going on in my car, but he said, all I can tell you is, and he started speaking in tongues. I said, well, I said, first of all, it's not hell, it's heaven. All right, let's get that right. But I sense in my heart, 
that you guys are still picking up the stranded, the weak, the weary, the hurting, and they're going to be strong. They're going to be strong. And I don't care. You got to ask. If you want bigger things, you want to do bigger things, you got to ask. If you want to do greater things, you got to ask. All right? I'm serious. This is what this is the word of the Lord God's given. You might be the only people that God sent me to today. But the Lord told me to tell you guys that those kids are so priceless. And I remember there was a big youth group here years ago. But you guys are about to see so many kids incorporated. They'll be from no, there'll be nobody from nowhere with nothing. They'll walk in here. And they will become firebrands who aren't afraid to open their mouths about the things of the kingdom of God. Praise God. That's, I don't have to lay hands on that's That's good. Christine, the only thing I got to tell you is I got a good looking son when he gets straightened out. Praise God. You know I'm messing with you. I'm just messing with you. Can we praise him again? If, uh, just for a couple of minutes, if you want, and if you want prayer, I'll be glad to stay here and pray with you all day. Um, but if, if you want prayer, I'll pray for you. I don't have anybody else I feel like I need to pray for. Um, but I couldn't say thank you enough because the ministry I'm enjoying now and the family I got now is because you guys were rescuing people. You know? And believe me, everything Pastor Hank said to me wasn't always positive. There's a few things he, times he just chewed me. And I needed it. I wouldn't tell him then. I needed it. He told me one time, he said, hey, before you preach, I want you to submit an outline. I thought, I walked out of that outline. I preached for four years in advance. I'm not submitting an outline. Guess what I did? I submitted an outline. I miss him. But it's so good. Paul shared test. Oh, would you lift your hands? Man, I sense the Lord in this house. I'm not in a rush right now. I don't want to be in a rush. I'm telling you. When I see what, the, what God's doing in this nation today, all I can do is say, come on, Lord. Whatever you want to do, wherever you want to do it, God, just do it. And don't let me mess up anything you want to do in my community. Please. There's uh, somebody here that's grieving a death that's been recent, and the Lord's going to give you some comfort over that and some strength this morning. I don't have to know who you are, but I do feel that strongly that you're grieving over someone who has died. And the Spirit of the Lord is going to give you more comfort than you can begin to imagine. There are others of you that heard me tell a portion of my story today that you've been encouraged because you feel like you're trapped somewhere and you can't get through it. But that's why God put people around you. Whether their words are sharp or they're, they're good, just receive them. And let God do the rest of them. And there are people in here trying to make decisions and God is saying, cut loose the dead things. Man, get the dead things out of your life. You know, they're not helping you. Just get rid of them. Get away from them. You know, step out. It's amazing how people will, will be and then the moment they start getting rid of burning the plows and start getting rid of the dead things, they'll come and say, man, Pastor, guess what God did? You know, I did what he said. Do what he's saying to do. It may seem so crazy and it may seem like, but, but that's what I've always liked and enjoyed. Listen. I'm not going to tell you I didn't like drinking. I loved it. I didn't just like it. I loved it. I lived for it. But July 8th, 1985, on a hot Wednesday night at the Watts Bar Church of God, I walked down with a three-piece suit on and said, enough is enough. I can't direct my life anymore. And when I was a freshman in high school, I went to North Cleveland Church of God and Ronnie Brock pastored there. And I'd made a commitment to the Lord then. But after six years of backing away from that commitment and Becoming an alcoholic. All it took was a few minutes down at an altar. I was free. That's why I've preached deliverance for years. I was free. I didn't take a beauty roll. I didn't go to AA meetings. I've had people from AA wait outside my revival services and they bash me. I said, I didn't say anything negative about AA. I just said, I didn't go to AA. I went to JC and HG and they set me free. Right? That's exactly right. That's what happened. I said that because there's somebody in this building that you've got family that's struggling like that, and you might be struggling like that, but it doesn't matter. God will do it for me. He'll do it for you. Amen. How great is the Lord. Can we give?